Welcome to Spark and Ignite Marketing, the podcast where business brilliance meets marketing mastery. I'm your host, Beverly Cornell, and I'm thrilled to embark on a journey of inspiration and innovation with you. Get ready to dive into the minds of successful and passionate small business entrepreneurs, unraveling the ideas that spark unique opportunities and ignite extraordinary marketing and success. It's time to fuel your entrepreneurial fire and let the sparks fly. Imagine the number of small businesses you interact with each week, including internet-based companies, contractors, plumbers, electricians, hardware stores, lumber companies, co-working spaces, healthcare needs, real estate, the meat market, or bakery, the movie theater, lodging, hair salons, barbershops, boutiques, law firms, accountants, specialists, repair and refinishing shops, the bowling alley, liquor stores, gas stations, auto repair, the car wash, restaurants and bars. The list is long. Now imagine your community without them. Small business entrepreneurs offer communities economic sustainability and are not necessarily driven by passing national trends. They bring growth, employment opportunities to local residents, and innovation to rural communities. They also generate revenue that converts local taxes into community improvements such as schools, parks, public transportation, and healthcare. The Better Business Bureau national statistics show that when you spend $100 at a local business, roughly $68 stays within that local community. Today, we're excited to feature Laura Kropp, who wears many hats as the 41st mayor of Mount Summons, Michigan, the youngest in its history, and a trailblazer for female leadership. Laura's journey resonates with small business owners and entrepreneurs as she brings much entrepreneurial experience to her role. From her roots in teaching special education to her position as director of sales at their family business, Bakes and Crop, Fine Cabinetry, Laura's entrepreneurial spirit has driven her every step of the way. Her insights into teaching, sales, and business management offer invaluable lessons for fellow entrepreneurs navigating their very own ventures. So join us today as we delve into Laura's fascinating journey, her innovative vision for Mount Clemens, and her dedication to uplifting small businesses. Beyond her civic leadership, Laura enjoys cooking and spending time with her family at their lake cottage. So get ready for an inspiring conversation with Mayor Laura Krupp, where entrepreneurial flair, I like that word, Laura, meets civic leadership. Welcome. Thank you, Beverly. Thanks for having me. feel honored. I'm so excited to talk to you and have this different, unique spin on our conversation today about entrepreneurship and the civic side of things and how you've gone from teaching special education, which requires a ton of patience and kindness, to working in your family business, to now working in your community really strongly, right? This evolution you've been on. Please share a little bit about how that journey took place and what had to happen to get you here. It's it's definitely been an interesting journey when if you would have asked me in college when I was picking my major, you know, do you want to be the mayor someday? I would have looked at you and went, what? And <laughs> no. But I do remember being a young girl and thinking about being a teacher and knowing that that was my path. But sitting, I remember in our auditorium at graduation and the superintendent being on stage and thinking. I'm going to be that one day. So I do believe that I've always had that leadership type of track, track, you know, and and I've always felt drawn to that role of being the person up there making the big decisions and leading people. It's just always been something I'm drawn to. I became a teacher and taught for 13 years in special education, all in the high school level. Loved it and really felt as though I wasn't using all my gifts. You know, it it wasn't, I wasn't completely fulfilled and didn't really know what I was going to do after stopping the teaching thing. But it did evolve into me working for our company. And that was a good change. And, and I say that by, it was a complete 180, right? So I was used to moving my life from with a bell, right? <laughs> and, yeah. Bell. And so, and then I remember going in and working in our company and going, okay, my husband would give me like, okay, this is, you know, 
the role and this is what I want you to accomplish and here's some goals and you know all these things and and then I would go okay yeah great and I'm, I'm really pumped for this and then was like not really understanding how to manage my time because nobody was ringing a bell I would get lost in tasks I did you know, didn't know how to think big um, because mm. I was curriculum as a teacher and I was given, you know, not that all teachers can't think big, but just it, it was a total mind shift. It was a real transformation for me in terms of going, looking in internally and saying, whoa, I have to operate differently in this and really being self-aware and and in order to be successful, I had to really change daily habits and and how I functioned. It was it was interesting. So it moved from and worked in, inside the sales world, and that was obviously pretty different from teaching. But was able to use some of those skills, believe it or not, in managing people, and learning what makes people tick, mm-hmm. and then using that <laughs> in the sales world. It became a point in our business where my husband and his business partner were actually merging two companies and becoming one and, and forming Bakes and Crop. And, you know, it was just the point where it was like, okay, we're going to sell the brand that I represented as the sales person. And did I want to go into the cabinet world? And would that work with a business partner? And so we really felt like it might not. Right. Because how can your business partner feel safe to give your wife feedback and genuine feedback? Right. I didn't want to inhibit the growth of the company. And so I stepped back from a daily role. And honestly, it was good. It was a really good thing for me in the sense that selling cabinets, selling countertops was not fulfilling to me. But in the meantime, you know, weren't you doing some public service at that time too with the school board? Sure, sure. And some other yep. Yeah, I was on the school board when I when I was teaching. I was on the school board in our community. I taught in different communities. When I stopped being on the school board and was working for a company, I thought I missed that piece, mm-hmm. right? I really missed that public service. There was a juncture when I stopped working for a company where we said, you know, we want to make this investment in the community. So, you know, and it was really important because there's there's zero money in public service. It was not because of monetary reasons. I make $3,500 a year as mayor. Wow. That being said, and it's not in every community, but here it is. We really felt passionately about being able to make this impact in our community by, you know, our gift to the city of being my time and my effort. I ran mission and I was in that role for four years. I did one term as a city commissioner. And then felt as though I could serve the city as mayor. And I went for it. And it was a tough, tough election. I had unseated a woman who had been mayor for 14 years and she had been on the commission or mayor for 30. So she was a pretty well-known figure (laughs) in town. What was the difference between being the commissioner versus the mayor? A city commissioner is similar to what a city council member is. Okay. Right. There's six commissioners. They make up of the board and then the mayor leads the board. The role of a commissioner is to be a part of that legislative body that makes ordinances and things that sets the vision of the city to move it forward. The mayor's job is to be the liaison between that board and then the city administration. So it's a little different. And I think it's a perception that the rest of the world I would say, but the rest of our community has that I'm a, p- a powerful person, right? I'm the leader. But you have this definite group of people who are doing a lot of the things for the city as well. Oh, <laughs> absolutely. So many people are, you know, it couldn't function on a daily basis. The, the streetlights would not come on if it was just up for the mayor. That's not how it works. <laughs> There's a don't... lot of people who are participating in government and city yeah. service to make the cities yeah. run. Yes, yes. Yeah. I was going to say the difference between, I think, what I realized in being a leader in a business role and then being a leader in a municipal role is that the municipal role, I mean, not that a company only does one thing. That's never 
right? They don't ever do one thing. But a municipal role, you have to become these experts in so many different facets, right? We have a water filtration plant and we have to make decisions on a former dump site that we had, or you have to be an economic planner. You have to be a business retention person and attraction person. You have to dabble in so many different things. And that that becomes, you know, you have to really focus, learn to focus on how to manage all that. You have to do podcasts. <laughs> and next month, I will be quickly going to classrooms uh, doing March's reading month everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right or next the rotary month, next month yeah. i'm doing junior achievement so i'll be talking about community and government so i'll be doing kind of the opposite of that that's funny right. what drives your passion for helping the community if you only make 3500 dollars and you, this is something that's so important to you, what is driving that passion laura i want to say everyone wants to feel as though their work will make an impact in someone else's life and I can honestly say that the work I do influences or impacts 16,000 residents in Mount Clemens. And hopefully my work goes past Mount Clemens, but I can say that. And that's a tremendous responsibility, but it fuels me. It fills me up knowing that I can help and make a difference in those lives. Really, I think it's the intrinsic accomplishment of knowing you're serving others. And it really does motivate me a lot. Before we dive back into the inspiring world of Spark and Ignite Marketing, let's take a moment to thank the incredible supporters who make this podcast possible. Today's episode is brought to you by BC and Associates Marketing, your go-to partner to help you spark and ignite your marketing. At BC and Associates Marketing, we believe in sparking ideas that lead to unique opportunities, whether you're a small business owner looking to ignite your brand or an entrepreneur seeking marketing mastery. Our team is dedicated to crafting tailored solutions that fuel your growth. From strategic planning to ongoing support, BC and Associates Marketing brings over 25 years of expertise to the table. We're not just marketers, we're your partners in success. Committed to sparking innovation and helping your business thrive in the ever-evolving landscape. So if you're ready to take your marketing to the next level, visit bcassociatesmarketing.com. Let's spark extraordinary opportunities together. A big thank you to BC and Associates Marketing for supporting the Spark and Ignite Marketing Podcast. Now, let's get back to the show and continue sparking those ideas. Serving 16,000 people, plus all the people who work for the city and somehow interact with the city every day, right? Somehow right. they come in to shop or work or whatever. What are some of the key challenges you've had to overcome or lessons that you've learned along the way? I was elected in November of 2019. And so four months later, the world shut mm. down. But honestly, it lent itself to be an advantage in my journey. And I only say that because it paused everything and no one else had the playbook. So it wasn't as if the township supervisor next door to me, who has been the township supervisor for I don't know, almost 30 years, who knows so much more than I do as a mayor for four months, he didn't know what was going on either. Right. I mean, it was just such an, a level playing field. And Equalizer, so I were, yes. Totally. I knew I did. I wasn't causing Mount Clemens any harm in that sense of not having the playbook. So that was helpful. And it also I am a huge, huge believer. It's partly with the influence of from my husband, but we would have never accomplished what we have in our business if it wasn't for my husband's incessant need for goal setting and strategic planning. Honestly, I mean, we even were such geeks about it that at the end of every year, Right before New Year's, we go out on a date and we have dinner and it's both of our responsibilities to show up with our five personal goals when you don't have to necessarily set five, but we try to do personal goals, family goals, professional goals. Okay. And then we discuss and we talk and we, you know, formulate a plan for the year. 
we really do live it, right? The strategic planning. So when there was no strategic plan when I became mayor, nobody believed in goal setting some years of struggle with that. I do feel like now we're on this really great path of that, but it took a long time. So that was a huge hurdle. But I do think COVID helped that we could kind of pause. And because when you first become elected, you're drinking from a fire hose. You know, there's so much stuff going on and you have to learn so many things. So it did give me that pause to say, okay, while we're all sitting at home, let's strategically plan, even if it's over Zoom. It was great. And that did help a lot, but it was a big barrier. And I would say the culture city hall as a workplace was completely different than I was used to from our company. And even for my teaching, you know, when I taught at Utica schools, I taught at a school called Utica High and they were completely family oriented. Everyone felt as though if something happened to me personally. I know I knew that the my coworkers were there. It just it was a really great nurturing environment. Our company is all about really taking care of people. So everyone who works for us, we have to go from all of that collaboration to an entity that was basically everyone hated me because they liked the person who marked me, right? It was a real doozy. (laughs) So not only did you have, because you know, as entrepreneurs, we often have like the fear of failure. We have the fear of success. Yeah. Sometimes we even have like imposter syndrome because we don't know like we really should be here. We yeah. can't believe we were struggling with all the things. I'm just yeah. trying to help, but yet I don't know a lot. And I need you guys to help me. And yet you don't like me. Right. And because I took that your friend's job. Yeah. And um, it was yeah, rough. I got to imagine. And just and to overcome all of this kind of situation where there was this imposter. I would feel like I was an imposter, literally. I and did. Some days I still feel like after I, being 48, I've overcome a lot of that. But when I first started out with my business, I certainly feel like who wants to pay me to say anything? Like, who cares? Right. You and I or well, somebody else. And you get this, like, you get this job, this title, right? Like, you're the mayor of a city. And people stop calling you your actual name. Like, people say mayor now. Like when they see me at the grocery store, like, oh, hey, Mayor, good job. Or what? I, or hey, Mayor, you know, I have a problem with my grocery. It's this weird. So you have this like, OK, wait, who are you talking to? Because my name's Laura. I was to call Mrs. Crop for a long time as a teacher, obviously. So it's there's a significant adjustment in that. And then also. It's politics, of course, this is a nonpartisan position, thankfully, because that can get real dicey. But also we're in Michigan during COVID. There was this whole notion of they were going to kidnap the governor. I don't know if you remember that. Oh, yes. And then yes. the woman leader. And even our sheriff was like, we need to keep a tab on you because everyone's really yes. hyper aware of women in leadership in elected official roles because of this stuff that was happening with the governor. Oh. I think it's also interesting That you lost kind of your personal identity in the sense of like your name when you took this role. Well, and I was reading Lean In, right, by Sheryl Sandberg. And, and, you know, I mean, her, her, I, I had been cooking for the fire department, right? I would take over a pot of soup or whatever. And I, I told them, listen, this gravy train will stop if you tell anyone I can cook. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, I read it in Cheryl Sandberg's, if you want to be the top, you want to be the, you can't be seen as maternal or homemaker. You don't bring things to the potluck. You pay, you bring the cups. And it's what the CEO or the men would do, right? So I, so I lost a lot of me at first. And you love to cook. That's one of your passions. I mean, you follow me on on social media, right? So you see all my... Right, right. Like, silly Plus what your husband food. does essentially revolves well, in your Right, so, of well, course. Right. Even more so, yes. Yes, exactly. Yes. And so it was really... And then even for him, you know, we would go to dinner in town and they're like, oh, how's it, how's it to be married to the mayor? Oh, now you're the first man. It was like emasculating, right? So like... Yeah, there were challenges that you just It's didn't a very do. interesting, like, yeah. switch of things that yeah. had to, like, you kind of yeah. had to, like, just kind of handle as it came up, but still 
Yeah. You don't think about that. Like, say, right, we've gotten to be a little bit better. We kind of understand your journey, where you've come from, some of the challenges and lessons you've kind of overcome along your path. Sure. And you highlight a moment or experience that maybe sparked a unique journey. I know you talked about a conversation, but was there something that was a spark or a unique thing that happened that you were like, no, this is what I'm supposed to be doing? There were a lot of those moments, especially considering the trajectory I thought I had, what I, where I'm at now, you know, and, and feeling as though, but I will say there was a moment actually in our personal life with my husband and I and our business that during the recession, like the super recession, right? In 2008. 2008. Yeah. yeah, 2009. Yeah. Housing crisis. Yes. There was no building going on. We were a small, small business at that point. I think we had less than 10 employees. It was very, we were significantly small. And it was a difficult storm to weather. And I remember at one point, my husband coming to the point where, thankfully, I was still teaching. So we had my teaching salary to fall back on. But we were at the point where we're like, this is it. We're not going to be able to make payroll. We're not going to make, you know, we need to lay people off. And you knew you were laying people off to an unemployment where they were going to an unemployment line that was so long. And there were no jobs out there. And we had a closing date. And I remember my husband saying, well, two things. I'm going to either go and work for someone else or I'm going to be a handyman. And I remember saying to him, and it was really not the nicest advice I ever gave, but I remember saying to him, one, I'm not going to be married to a handyman because you'll be miserable. And two, you can't go work for someone else because you'll just tell them how to run their business and they'll fire you. Everyone is going through this. It's not like you're a bad business person. It's that the whole world, the economy was practically collapsing, right? We have to just hang on. I know you know how to retool and figure this out. And and he created this wood countertop line and opened up the market of, you know, instead of being a very small niche type of product. And then, you know, instead he created this wood countertop line, which then snowballed and ended up introducing us to our current business partner. It really saved us. And I think I remember that conversation being a real pivotal moment. Of, he just needed a kick in the butt, you know, and mm -hmm. he's an amazing business person. I mean, honestly, he's the guy like who's created so much. I all need somebody sometimes to like yeah. center us. Yeah. In right. And it, and it oh. was the weird way of being the cheerleader, I guess. It, I think there were moments where it's like, sure, it would have been easier. Right. It would have been easier to just yeah, like, sometimes. Yeah. Because it was like starting over. You know, mm -hmm. we were at this level, but we were in the basement level uh, after that because to then rebuild. But it was what needed to happen in order to now they're like the second largest manufacturer of luxury cabinets in New York. They are opening their second show. Well, they're opening a new showroom in Manhattan. They're going from like a thousand square feet to almost three. Nice. So if you could there, you can make it anywhere. Right. I mean, so in, uh, who would have dreamt that from right. laying off everyone during the recession? So you know, we decided. To be a handyman, he would have been successful at that too. For my yeah, sure. who are local to Michigan and Detroit area, the housing crisis devastated the area. And a lot of small businesses struggled to stay alive. And then yeah. we had COVID not very long after, right? So you have this, yeah, I think yeah. the fortitude wow. of the Michigan entrepreneur is pretty incredible. And yeah. very admirable. Yeah. I, obviously, yeah. I was raised there, so I feel a very strong kinship to the area. I have a lot of clients that I work to help with marketing in the area. And I just think they're extraordinarily resilient For sure. entrepreneurs. I mean, you should probably write a book. <laughs> I think, yeah. and I think so, that uh, most good books start with a challenge like that, right? Like, it's either like, it's either 
make it or break it moments that I think define who we are, define our business. And I think what he did was what he did and, and maybe with your help, right? He had to look at how do I keep this alive as opposed to just closing it by reframing it caused him to have to find a way. And when you have to find a way, boy, do people get creative. That I think that's, that's a very that's defining hard. moment. I think that's the entrepreneurial spirit is born out of the absolute need of there's really not a choice to fail. There's just because there's no safety net. There's there's no I mean, you can't fail. Right. There's just mm-hmm. way too much at stake. And I kind of feel as though the challenges that we talked about when I first became mayor, the people that did occupy the downtown had put their heart and soul and had so little in return at that point that, I mean, I just could not fail those people. That was just, and then with COVID, I'm like, we are going to survive. And we did. And (laughs) now we're at less than 30% of our downtown is vacant. And that's still not an acceptable number, you know, until Mm -hmm. I have single digit. 100%, 100% ideally, right? Right, of course. I think that, that, that spirit and that drive and Paul always says it's if it was easy, everyone would do it. I also think that everyone's capable, but it's OK to not want to do it either, because being in a leadership position or having your own business is not a nine to five gig. You know, when I mean, when we are not actually at work, we have to make a very conscious decision to be present for our kids or be present for the other aspects of our life because it could be all life consuming. And it was for many, many years. Now we have the privilege because we have this incredible team at the city and at our business. We have incredible team members who help alleviate some of that. But even when we're out on out of town or, you know, we we love to travel and there's still that check in I mean, it's just, it's, there's never a complete disconnect. I don't think there can be. Part of our DNA just is. Yeah, it is. Right. And we care. So we want to like make sure everything right. is good. And yes, it is. Yeah. I don't mean it to be in a, like in a negative or cumbersome kind of way. Sure. I mean, sometimes yes. like, oh, you know, <laughs> sometimes we don't need a break. <laughs> we don't need a break. There's no question. Right. 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 Absolutely. <laughs> So how do you identify and capitalize on emerging trends and even the economics of it all, right? The opportunities for the city of Mount Clemens and small businesses. I would say, so one of the things that I started with, as soon as I became a commissioner, I became the rep for our regional organization in terms of government. So I became, in our region, it's called SEMCOG, Southeastern Michigan Council of Government. Being a part of those larger organizations where you network with other communities or, you know, and in business, obviously it's networking groups and things, but like staying on top of it in that way, knowing what other people are doing so that it's not necessarily that I have to come up with this amazing, completely new idea. It's just knowing when I should not be resting on my laurels and saying, okay, you know, we know the trend for population is a population decline in most states and learning the data so that you can you can adjust your community to meet the needs of people. And I think that's that's key. So paying attention to these organizations that help you feed that or and learn. And that's not different than like me. I'm paying attention to what's happening in the marketing industry. I'm looking at the trends on social media. I'm looking at what is what are people consuming? Like I yeah. I'm I'm doing the same thing as a business. You have to do the same thing as the mayor, right? The only difference really for municipalities is that most likely what I'm doing, like, for example, when, what Paul's doing right now in his growth mindset that he has right now, opening showrooms and, and uh, expanding the workforce. They study the market. They decide where they want to go. They make decisions. They can make these things happen. And they usually happen within what? Uh, six to 24 month period where in my world, Lake Cruiser, you know, I mean, it's different, right? In that sense. Mm -hmm. So that has been a struggle at our house too, because 
you know, to go from entrepreneurs and they're like, oh, let it, we'll just make it happen. And I'm like, okay, so I have to convince six other people to vote that. And you know, listen, right? and that's a very different world. <laughs> so it um, is a different yeah, world. For sure. For sure. And then, you know, the funding. I mean, in a business, you're much more in control of revenue, right? Um, in theory, but that's in the in the municipal world. So, and there are challenges. We're the county seat, the capital of Macomb. We're in Macomb County. We're the capital of that county. Well, that's great and all, except that every government building that's within our city limits is non-taxable. So that's where our revenue comes from: is property taxes. We're actually a pretty small city. We're only four square miles. We've got this like real robots downtown, except that we have all these county buildings. And so we're 48% of our land is taxable. I have to do everything that a regular city does with half the budget. No problem. Right. Is it a three-year term, four-year term? How does it work with the mayor? No, it's terrible. So it's different in every city, but in our city, it's every two years. Wow. Yeah. So you're essentially always having to. Yeah. 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 You I'll, don't get any kind of breather in there. I have, though. I've been super fortunate because I had that big election, the first one. Right. And then the last two two elections, I run unopposed. So. Oh, wow. No deal. Right. Does help. It does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's been amazing. Now, will that continue? Yes. But. There'll probably be another Laura who wants to see that's right. That's great. come up at some point, right? Right. Yeah. What advice would you give to entrepreneurs who are looking to find their unique opportunities yeah. in the market for themselves? Write a business plan. Step one. Have goals. Have goals. Write right. a business plan. It will change a million times as your journey continues. But if you don't have that vision and where you want to go, then when you come to a city to look for property or, you know, the perfect space for your bill, for your business, or, you know, if you cannot, uh, or if you really can't pass that message on what you want and what you really see your business doing out in the market, then we can't help. Right. Because we have to have a clear picture of where you're going and what you're doing and how that can fit within our community. So th- that one. And then two, I would say for entrepreneurs, they will know the market, of course, but that's part of business planning. But then also you have to have a realistic idea of how this will impact your entire life. I have, have we have had businesses that have come to McClemens who you know, think that they can make it by saying, well, we're only going to be open. We may be a retail store. We're not going to be open on the weekends or it's a beautiful summer day. So we're going to go out on our boat and, uh, you know, hang out. It's like, well, if you're not open, then you're not making money. You have to be realistic about what that means and how it impacts your life. And are you willing to make those sacrifices? And it's okay to say, I'm not. It's okay. But you have to be realistic. And then, of course, reach out to your governmental agencies. There's a lot of things out there for business support, but you have to be educated and to know what those are. And and there are people that can help connect you. So find the connectors in your community. What are some things that you, the government, can help with small business? If you have a downtown development authority within your community, a lot of times they offer programs that Uh, help you either find space in a community or physical footprint, or they can help you connect with things like chambers, chamber groups, or business networking groups. We offer things like a a building facade grant, right? You want, we want to promote upgrading your, the facade of your building because then it obviously upgrades the entire city, right? So we offer these small grants and just letting people know like I love listening to our small businesses then and them telling me all of what they want to be doing in the next six months and what their growth plans are, because then I hear all kinds of opportunities out there mm-hmm, mm-hmm. to grant. Maybe it's, oh, and this person's looking for a job. And that's one of the biggest roles that I enjoy as mayor is being 
being that person that can say, oh, wait, this person's looking for that. And this is what you need, you know, and, mm-hmm. you know, and that's my greatest joy is when I get to make those connections and it works out. I mean, we had this, this poor, oh, I felt so bad. This woman who she was renting some space. She had been in town for, I would say, almost 15 years. Her name was Jennifer. She had this great salon. It was awesome. The building owner decided that she needed to be out in 45 days. I think in the end, she, yeah. And she had a clientele who had been with her for 15 years. And she had, I think, at least 10 women working for her. And she was going to be gone in 45 days. We had to find a new space. So we got her, she found a space. We were able to, she connected with our account, with some people at our economic development office at the county and found a grant for her and were able to get her $25,000 for that new space in the build out. Wow. And it, she said it was, you know, and it was just real serendipitous really, because now it's like this amazing building that she's at and it's just this beautiful salon and it's so much more than I think she could have ever even dreamed. But to have that little bit of influence and help with that was I when I walked in I thought it was transformative for her Mm -hmm. that's amazing that's so cool I love those kind of stories I feel like when I help a client I'm I'm affecting their lives in a lot of ways you know that that building a business is an American dream right and I'm very much an honor to be on the journey with them as they built their businesses you're they're paying for college from their business for their 18 year old they're buying the lake house or they're getting the boat right. or they're whatever it looks like for them. It, yeah. You're helping their dreams. We have a woman in town who told me the other day, I have health care for the first time. She can go to the doctor when she's sick. Like that said, huge, like altering thing. That's huge. Right. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And it's because, you know, yeah. it's small efforts every day. It's not like it's just because of one stroke of a pen. These are all little things that cumulatively add up. And build something for that family, that community. When I talk about the statistics at the beginning of the show is how important these small businesses are to a community and what that looks like. And like the $68, 68% of what a business makes and what that looks like for the community. That's significant. As a mayor, I'm going to kind of flip this too a little bit. How do you, what's your most effective way to promote Mount Clemens? I'm going to talk about marketing. That's my, Mm -hmm. I could totally nerd out, right? So as the mayor, you're the face of the brand. Yeah. And you help help (laughs) promote businesses to come to you guys. You have to promote. So you're doing a lot of self-marketing in that respect. And sure. as, as if Mount Clem- Clemens is like a business and you want to attract customers or your constituents. Tell me right. about what does Mount Clemens do to promote themselves from a sure. marketing perspective? So during that whole COVID craziness, when I said we got to pause, we really took the time to rebrand the city. So that was step one. I should have had an example for you, but our old logo, I swear. I always used to tease that it looked like something that from the 1970s version of like Star of David. It was such okay. a weird, yeah, it was like the best way to describe it. So, you know, that doesn't really lend itself to a logo for our city, I wouldn't think, but it was a strange brand. And so we didn't really know what we wanted to be when we grew up. We're a 200 year old city, 200 and we were 18, 18. 207 years old or something, we really had to do some surveying of our community members and trying to get that buy-in. And then we did this whole rebranding of the city. And so now, you know, obviously that's much more than a logo, right? Mm -hmm. It's the whole notion of having a mission, a vision, and really understanding where you want to take your organization. And so all of that was part of it. I was really proud of that initiative. And so everything from our city trucks that you still look like jalopies driving down the street with these old logos. I mean, it was just terrible. We really were just projecting this image of old and tired. 
And so, and we really kept getting that kind of feedback from communities outside of us. And we want to be the downtown of our county, right? Because we are the capital. So, and we have this wonderful, walkable, amazing downtown. We had to learn to freshen up and give a much more fun image so that people want to come and visit us. So we did that. And so using now social media, we did hire a marketing firm that does our social media professionally because we had someone who thought they were decent at Facebook on their own personal account (laughs) as an employee was doing our Facebook. And we were all, you know, everyone was scratching their heads at why we didn't have much engagement. We finally bit the bullet and hired a professional company that's been a really great return on investment. And and then my my contribution, I would say personally, is doing things like this and talking about how the things that we're doing and getting that message out there that we're evolving as a community and really trying to and we want people to come to us. We're an inclusive community that just says, hey, come come see what we have to offer now and talking about all these new businesses. And I think when you have this, you know, influx of new coming in, all these new businesses coming in, and they're doing all their own marketing initiatives, then you can help support those. And we do that through our downtown development authority. We have a lot of different initiatives going on, but they're all now pushing this consistent message right through our branding process, which is very powerful instead of just these little pieces that weren't making much of an impact. But in the messaging creates the brand. So it it doesn't happen overnight. It it is a concerted effort that has to be consistently put out there. But that over time, that brand becomes extremely important to to immediate awareness of who you are and what you do and why people should either buy from your company or come to Mount Clemens or whatever that looks like for the brand. One thing I I always ask everybody on this on the episodes. And I think the reason why I ask this is because everybody does this, whether you're a husband, a wife, a child, a parent, we use storytelling to connect to each other. Yeah. And so I always ask, how do you use storytelling to connect with your community? Because I think even sharing stories about the hair salon. To me, those stories are the people. It's not a statistic. Right. It's, it makes it right. real for all of us to right. understand. So yeah. How do you use storytelling? Because you are out, you're doing the, the grand openings, you're doing, the, like as the mayor, you're the one that's there seeing right. all this. So how important has storytelling been, been to you in your job as yeah. mayor? Oh, absolutely. It's, it's exactly what you're saying is it is a tool to really help people connect and have, if people don't have a connection with Mount Clemens, then they're, then we're just another one of the 26 communities of our county. There's so much competition around us of places to go eat, places to go see a show, places. To, so if people don't have an emotional connection, and, and like you said, storytelling is a huge way to do that, to get people to see how, what your story is, what's the feel of your community, what I would consider an ambassador to the city right? That's really what my job is as mayor. Take every opportunity I have to just make sure I I have a story that will connect or hopefully connect. And it's knowing the stories. So I spend a lot of time really just being with the people in my community. I have lunch in downtown several times a week and obviously it helps that I live here and work here and I, you know, so I'm, I'm immersed, right? But also I make an effort to stop in at places that I know I'm going to see a wide variety of people and connect with them. We have this little coffee shop in town that's amazing. And it's like town square in there. I'm a frequent visitor because I love the coffee, but also because I know I'm going to make those connections and I'll hear what is everybody up to and checking in. And, and it's important, you know, you, that's where you really gauge the health of your community. I think I think listening is probably one of the most important things that a brand can do, too. And I think right. if you can listen <laughs> to your customers, your constituents, hear what they're saying. 
And I think even when you rebranded, like doing the survey, talking about what people are, what their perceptions are, what do they want to be known for? Things like that and including them, it, it, it all is part of the buy-in at the end of the day. Sure, yeah. certainly. However, you you can't just randomly make those decisions. Like you have to be informed so that you can make the right decision because rebranding is no joke. Like that is a laborious process that is, well, if you do it right, it's very well thought out. Right. And it's a big process. So yeah, I think it is a big process. And, and, right, and, and that's an important part of the process. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I felt the heart and soul of your business. So if you don't do it, if you don't have the heart and soul, people want to do business with humans. And if you don't have a heart and soul, you take away your humanity. So yeah. that's not at all powerful. Right. So exactly. yeah. it's so interesting to make the tie in from the business level to the government level. And some of that has been really intriguing to me. Yeah. Uh, I knew there would be a connection when you just started that, that heart and soul thing and storytelling. One of the things that I did quite often during COVID and during and after, but haven't done lately, and I've been getting complaints actually that I haven't been doing them. So it makes me think that they were even more impactful than I thought. But I would do these, you know, how information was changing daily, right? Uh, In the during the pandemic. And so the this initiative was born out of that because we had to get information out to people very quickly. And it was really difficult to like, write it out and get it to people and expect them to read it, especially when it was daily. So I've been, I would, the governor would come on usually midday and she Mm -hmm. would have a list of things that topics to address. And so after she would do that, I would sit down with our city manager and we would formulate how did these impact Mount Clemens and what did we need to adjust and what information did we need to get out to the public? And then we would end the day with that. And normally I would be going home and my kids would be still either doing homeschooling because they were, you know, off of school. They were still quarantined. And most of the time I would be like chopping vegetables and getting ready to make dinner. And I was sitting, standing at my kitchen island doing it. And I noticed that when I was in my kitchen, I think that it was really, and people have been asking me like, well, when are you going to do those videos again at home? I'm like, well, there's no like daily briefings. <laughs> Thank you, God, and get, don't wish that. Up. But, you know, we were talking about how maybe I can implement that in a different way, but Did you do like a still weekly do- update? This, what, this is what happened to Mark Clevens this week or something like that yeah. where people can just, yeah. you know. Yeah, or even if it's after a commission meeting, like the next day or something. I don't know. I don't know what it's going to be this next evolution of it, but I'm going to resurrect it because everyone was really, they seemed to connect with it. So, but it was interesting. That was not anything that was, that was really just out of, born out of pure necessity. Authentic yeah. part of, it was authentic to you. Yeah. It was a peak sure. to your life and it made you human. Like everybody else, everybody chops vegetables, right? To get ready for dinner and all the things. So there was a real human element to that. that, And there was a peek into your life. I'm going to move us into the lightning round. Okay. Afraid of the name because I feel like everyone gets really nervous about the name. Oh, no, no. It's a question. I just want you to answer. We're not going to really talk about it, but I just want you to answer it. Okay. Got it. Rapid fire. But just uncover your favorite business insights, tools, and what inspirations for you. Okay. Are you ready? Perfect. What is your favorite way to connect and network? Uh, my coffee talks. What is your favorite business marketing book? Anything by Seth Godin. What's your favorite podcast? Anything by Seth Godin. <laughs> no, <laughs> Smartless. What's your favorite business tool or app? Uh, I guess my notes app on my phone, honestly. <laughs> What's your favorite way to stay focused or like relieve yourself of stress at work? A lot of our offices right now are on our river. And so oftentimes I'll just like go and take a walk by the river. Mm. If you see me on a walk, I might need the five minutes. To by <laughs> what is your favorite marketing tactic for the for the city? I think I think our right now we're going to do these new like commissioner spotlights. And so they're going to introduce all our new people and I think giving people an opportunity to see that authentic you know the person behind the position I like that 
anything organic like that, right? Personable. What's your favorite source of inspiration? Who inspires you or what inspires you? Just taking a walk downtown and talking to the people on the street. If there is somebody listening, but I'm, I'm assuming there are going to be lots of people listening that either need inspiration or are feeling overwhelmed by their by owning a, a business or don't know what their next step is going to be yeah. or they're just starting out, mm-hmm. right? So they don't, so you said, get a business plan. But business plans can be a little bit complicated to put together. Is there something easy that they could do today that could help them with their unique opportunity or ignite their journey to yeah. their business? I think I've there have been moments in my life when the when the path forward has paralyzed me. It's too much. It's too much. There's moments in the day, our city manager, we unearthed so many things here of like, oh, can you believe this is happening? Or, you know, all this. And sometimes I say to him, you know, because he'll come in and say, okay, are you ready for this one? And I'll say to him, can you save it for tomorrow? It's okay to know everything right now, but it's not okay to do nothing. Right. And I have, I will say that Mel Robbins really inspires me on this one. Because she'll say, it's okay, right? It's okay. It's okay if you're not, if you're not, don't have it all figured out. But it's not okay to do nothing. And so even if it's writing a list, write the list, you know, and then give yourself some credit for it. If it, if it seems like a really big thing, try to break it down for yourself, right? Yeah. Into manageable chunks. Right. And- so it just, I can do that. I can cross that off. Right. And I think that, you know, people feel as though they have to have it all figured out all right now. And I tell that to my son, who's, you know, he'll be 17. He's going to he's trying to figure out, you know, what do I want to do with my life? And it's like, you can't know it's 16 or 17. You just have to try to put yourself on a path that that path will lead you to good and better things. Right. I mean, but otherwise, you can't know everything. Right. You're not a mind reader. And you can't make everyone happy. Yeah. I say that you, as long as you work hard and you take the opportunities presented to you, all good things are going to happen. Right. right. Like you'll learn. Even if you mess up, you're going to learn. You know, it's okay. For sure. It's okay. It's fair. And, and just being open to opportunities is so, so important. Right. I mean, you have to be open. Do you know anybody who knows everything? All of us are learning. And if if you did it right, I feel like that's part of our journey is just to learn and continuously grow and be open, like you said, to those, to whatever comes your way. And even when something is presented to us that maybe we don't know how to solve, make the list, make a connection that maybe knows more than you, because there are people who are incredibly smarter than I am. Right. And and capitalizing on on those relationships. Yes. Try and say. I can help with this. Exactly. Yeah. I think the people that I respect and I admire the most are the ones who are one, good listeners, and two, really have an idea of what makes them happy and makes them, and they know how to balance their life to, to meet the needs of whatever organization they're leading, but then also what makes them happy and that it translates into their work. You have to be a person who is confident in order to lead, right? So but how how you find that confidence, you know, I think is just as important as what what position you think you want in the future. All good stuff. When I first started out with this podcast, this is my second podcast. I had a podcast back in 2007 that, before it was cool to podcast. Okay. <laughs> But what I've always found is I have an intention to teach others yeah. and then I learn so right? And it's not like it's brand new stuff, but it reminds me, take the time to really talk about the things that I think make people yeah. successful and bring the joy. This journey we're all on is just be a good yeah. human. Yeah. I call it the don't be a jerk ordinance. Actually, I don't call it jerk. I call it, I don't know if I can be explicit, but I call it the A word. Don't be a... <laughs> Don't be an A word. If we could have an ordinance that said, 
don't just be a good person. It would it would, you know, take out your trash and put it at the curb and follow the rules. How do we you know, find that being a good neighbor? <laughs> well, even as customers, like a lot of times, don't be a jerk as a customer. Like be yes. the, the person who's running that business or behind that cash register as a human being. And have to like, certainly they have to be kind as well and all of those things, but they're all human too. And we all have moments. We've all had moments. And a little bit of grace and forgiveness can go a long way. Yes. Right. Especially with like social media, people can just be mean. So like, but hiding behind the keyboard and not looking into a human being's eyes is very yeah. well emboldened. in politics. That's a whole other. Uh, I, can imagine, <laughs> I can only imagine what that looks like for you. Before we go, please yeah. share with our listeners okay. how they can learn more about Mount Clement and keep up with your latest projects. Well, if you are looking to visit us here in Mount Clemens, you can find out all the information about our great downtown, including restaurants, retail, and entertainment at downtown Mount Clemens. And Mount is spelled all the way out. Downtownmountclemens.org. You can also visit our city website, which would be any kind of municipal needs you may need, uh, which would be mountclemens.gov. And then if you are a a business owner, an entrepreneur, or you are, are a developer, then we are we have information for you at thinkmtc.com. All kinds of fun stuff. I'm sure you're on social too, all over the place. Congratulations on your podcast and the new book. It's amazing. It's, I can't wait. I've got to order my copy today. Thanks again for having me. It was really a pleasure. Well, yeah. This has been really insightful, Laura. I appreciate it. I'm going to call you Laura and not Mayor in my closing. Uh, I feel like I've been left inspired by your journey and your unwavering. You. you really exemplify the spirit of innovation and leadership from your pioneering role as the youngest mayor in Mount Clemens history to your entrepreneurial endeavors with your husband in the sales and business management side of things. We've gained valuable insights in Laura's approach to civic leadership and her dedication to fostering a thriving environment for small businesses. Her passion for entrepreneurship shines through serving as a beacon of inspiration for aspiring business owners and entrepreneurs alike. As we conclude, I'm going to go back. I missed a whole... As we conclude, yeah. I want to thank Mayor Laura Kropp for sharing her wisdom and experiences with us. Join us next time for another engaging episode featuring entrepreneurial leaders making a difference in their communities. And until then, stay inspired and keep pursuing your entrepreneurial dreams. Wrapping up another episode of Spark and Ignite Marketing. For your weekly dose of inspiration, join our community on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, or TikTok for behind the scenes and exclusive content. Until next time, keep the spark alive and stay inspired. Oh,